We read in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? <laughs> then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Having looked over the past weeks at what baptism is and its function as a spiritual sign and seal of the covenant of grace, we moved on to note uh, or to look at the issue of who should be baptized And we noted that the debate around that matter, the subjects of baptism, is really a debate about the children of believers as a class in the church. How do our children relate to God's covenant? Are they included or excluded from it? And should they receive the sign of it? Well, as we began to answer that question, we started at the beginning by looking at the Old Testament to see how God dealt with children in the Old Testament. And we noted three very important things. The first was that they were included in the promise of the covenant, that God promised to be the God of believers and their children. And not just that they would have benefits like uh, obtaining the, the land of Canaan, no, rather that God would be their God. They were included in the promise. Secondly, they received the sign, the sign of circumcision with all of its spiritual significance that we considered last time. And thirdly, they were members of the old covenant church. They were circumcised within the boundaries of God's covenant people. They were not out with the church as were the uncircumcised Philistines. So let's have these things driven into our minds and hearts again at the beginning uh, this morning. Uh, They were included in the promise, they received the sign, and they were members of the Old Covenant Church. What we want to do today is to move on to consider what the New Testament teaches us about children and the church. And as we embark on that, it's important that you remember that God does not simply wipe away everything that he has established in the Old Testament when we come to the New Testament. It's not as though he is starting from scratch. Rather, what he has established in the Old Testament that he has not cancelled or changed in the New Testament still stands with all a force, all force and divine authority. So that it's wrong to come to the New Testament and imagine that we need to be retold things that God has already told us, things that he's laid down in the Old Testament. On the contrary, if the New Testament remains silent on the status of children in the promise, in the church, and with respect to the sign, things remain the same. Things remain the same. If it has changed, however, you would have to agree that it would be a very radical change. A privilege that was so great, the inclusion of children in the promise, receiving the sign, members of the church, a privilege that was so great, now being taken away from children in the New Testament, God is going to make that point very clear, we could say. So we come to the New Testament with this in mind. Silence would still demand their inclusion. But the New Testament is not silent. The New Testament, in fact, speaks to confirm what we saw last time in the Old Testament, that our children are still included in the promise. They are still regarded as members of the church. And we will argue that they should still receive the sign of the covenant and membership of the church, which is baptism. So what I want to do over the next few weeks is to demonstrate this. These three things are found also in the New Testament. And we're going to look at two of them 
this morning, namely that children are included in the promise of the covenant in the New Testament and children are included as members of the church in the New Testament. Now, I say at the outset, as I have done in previous weeks, that this is going to require mental effort from you. And therefore, I want you to understand that you are to be working in your worship right now as God uh, preaches the word of his truth to you. You can't sit passively and imagine you're just going to absorb this as a sponge. You need to engage your mind, wrestle with what the Bible teaches, and we're going to be looking at a whole variety of texts. So consider with me, first of all, that children are included in the promise of the covenant in the New Testament. And I want to look at three significant <coughs> texts. The first is in the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. The day of Pentecost being a, a momentous day in the whole of the history of God's redemption. The day when the risen and ascended Lord Jesus Christ pours out his spirit upon the church in fulfillment of the promise that God made through the prophets to our fathers, and the day in which we transition from the old covenant administration of the church to the new covenant form and administration of the church, as God is about to embark on taking his gospel to the ends of the earth. A hugely significant day. You can think of it like... Uh, uh, the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. It has that kind of redemptive historical significance. The outpouring of the Spirit upon the church taking its New Testament form so that the gospel will go to the ends of the earth. Well, what do we find in Acts chapter 2? We find Jews... And proselytes, in other words, Gentile converts to Judaism. Jews and Gentiles, but all professing the, the, the name of Israel's God. All spiritually the seed of Abraham, we might say. And Peter preaches Jesus and the resurrection to them. He draws from Psalm 16, and then he speaks from Psalm 110. He makes it clear that they have crucified the Messiah and with wicked hands they have slain him. And when they hear this, the Spirit blesses them so that they are convict in their, convicted in their hearts. Verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter answers their question, in verse 38 and 39, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Upon this, these adult male uh, Jewish people who've gathered for the Feast of Pentecost they repent and they receive baptism in verse 41, the sign of the New Testament administration of the church. So they're circumcised as children. That was good for the Old Covenant, but we're moving into the New Testament administration of the church, so they receive the sign of the New Testament administration of the church. But Peter says to them, the promise is to you and to your children. And that is a very important statement. Now, nobody denies that it's in the Bible. It's clear. Peter says this. But what does he mean by it? Well, some of our brethren simply link it to the immediate statement that he has made. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of of the Holy Ghost. And so to them, Peter is saying this, if you repent and be baptized, you'll receive the remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Ghost. And if your children repent and are baptized, they shall receive the remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Ghost. 
And if all who are far off repent and are baptized, they shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The immediate statement that he has made is really all that this promise embraces. But I would say to you this morning, if that's what Peter meant, it would be a very strange and redundant way to state it. But why not just state it as he has already stated it earlier on in this chapter? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Why not just say that? Why not just say whoever repents and, and is baptized shall receive the, the, uh, the gift of the Holy Ghost and the remission of sin? Why does he distinctly break it down into these three groups? You, your children, and those which are far off. Well, the answer is found in the context. The overall context of biblical history and the immediate context of what is taking place on the day of Pentecost. The old is passing away. The new age of fulfillment is coming all according to the promise God has made in the old covenant. And yes, many changes are in store for the church of the Lord. Now remember this. Peter is not preaching to you and to me in 21st century North America. Peter is preaching to a congregation of Jewish adult males gathered together to observe the Feast of Pentecost. And their ears were the first ears to hear this statement from a Jewish preacher. The promise is unto you and to your children and to all who are afar off. So what you need to do is to go to Jerusalem and borrow their ears and listen to this sermon the way they would have heard it. And with those ears, you would remember that for centuries the promise has been to you and to your children. And you would also understand that for centuries you were waiting with the promise that was to you and to your children to a time when Messiah would come and extend his grace to the nations of the earth. Those that the prophets spoke of so frequently as those who were afar off, those who were upon the sea, they're going to be brought in to the covenant people of the Lord. We need to hear with those ears. We can't take our presuppositions and impose them upon the text and destroy its context. <laughs> so with those ears, let's try to understand what they would have heard when they heard this. The promise is to you. What would they have understood by that? Well, to the Jew, the promise was a loaded term. It was a term that was infused with 2,000 years of significance. There are various promises, of course. If you look back to verse 33, Peter has already spoken of one. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which ye now see and hear. So that's the Old Testament promise that the Spirit is going to be poured out upon the ascension of Jesus. He's already spoken of that in his sermon quoting from the prophecy of Joel. In that day, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. A messianic covenant promise that the Jews were waiting to be fulfilled. Well, Peter refers to to that in verse 38, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So the promise will have reference to that. The old covenant promise of the messianic age and kingdom. But let's turn to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, where Paul shows us again that this whole idea of the promise is a theologically loaded term to the Jewish mind. Galatians chapter 3, and look first of all there at verse 14, where Paul says that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. That's what's happening on the day of Pentecost. 
the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Note that. Then look at verse 17 and verse 18. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, that's the Abrahamic covenant he's speaking of there. The covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, that's the Mosaic covenant, the law which was 430 years after cannot disannul, listen, that it should make the promise of none effect. Now note what he's done. The covenant confirmed with Christ or in Christ is the Abrahamic covenant. And at the end of the verse, he calls it the promise over against the law. You as a Jew are picking that up. That's what he intends you to understand. Verse 18, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Verse 29, and if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Do you see that? Now let's go back to Jerusalem. And there you are, a Jew. And you and your fathers have been waiting for the fulfillment of the promise for 2,000 years. And Messiah has come. And Peter says, the promise is to you. And to your children. It's a repetition of the promise that had been in force for centuries in the old covenant church, which included believers and their seed. Significantly, it's as though Peter is reassuring them that though certain things are changing, this will not change. That the pattern of God's inclusion of believers and their children is going to continue as a constitutional principle of the covenant in the New Testament period. If not, I submit to you that there would have been more than a question on the day of Pentecost. There may well have been an uproar. Because they are waiting for greater blessing. And a time of greater expansion that the prophets predicted. And if when that day comes, the children are no longer included in this promise, then the day of Pentecost is in fact a day of mass excommunication of the children of the Lord's people. The message is this wonderful news, Messiah has come, but children, children are now out of the covenant. The day that we hope for, the day of expansion, is really a day of restriction. Not so, Peter says, the promise is still to you and to your children. And praise God, there are greater blessings that have come upon the new covenant church, not lesser. Very well, but our Baptist, Baptist brothers will say, yes, but, but it also says those who are afar off. You're misreading the text. It's everyone who believes they're talking about here. Well, that term afar off certainly has a geographical significance because the gospel is going to go to the nations of the earth. But more importantly, it has a spiritual significance. Because it's used throughout the Old Testament and indeed into the New Testament of Gentiles, those who were outside the covenant people of God. So those who were afar off were not just geographically distant. They were spiritually separated and cut off from the covenant promise. Let me prove it to you from the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 and following. Paul says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made 
by hands. Stop there. He says, you were Gentiles and you were uncircumcised. Gentiles and outside the covenant people of God. He expands in verse 12 that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, listen, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, children, he's not saying you one time lived a long way from Jerusalem, but now you've all moved there. He's saying you were spiritually afar off. You were cut off from the covenant. But Christ has come and you've been brought in. You've been brought in. How does he speak of it? Those who were afar off. They've been made nigh. Now back to Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, what does Peter say? Peter says the promise is to you and to your children and to all those who are afar off. And we've got to stop taking a modern individualist and dispensational mindset to that text. He's saying you, your children, the Gentiles and brethren, all these three were in the, in the, in the original promise to Abraham. Chapter 17, I will be a God to you and to your children after you. Chapter 12, even before that. In your seed, Abraham, all the nations of the world are going to be blessed. All those three elements that Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost, they were all in the promise to Abraham. And for 2,000 years, the church was waiting for their fulfillment in Christ, and it's come. And Peter says, it's still to you and to your children, but it's more expansive. I'm bringing the nations of the earth in. That the Gentiles are going to come in en masse, the way they've been trickling in through you very proselytes who were there on the day of Pentecost itself. The promise is to you and to your children and all who are afar off. Do you see what we're saying today? The New Testament is not silent. It confirms what God said in the Old Testament. The promise is still to you and to your children. But let's move forward. Acts chapter 16 verse 31. We don't just have the day of Pentecost. But the second sub point here is the promise to the Philippian jailer. Now there on the day of Pentecost, God said the promise is to you, to your children, and to all who are afar off. So God begins to call his people from afar. <coughs> you read in the book of Acts, and the opening chapters concern the Jew in Jerusalem and Judea. But gradually the gospel is taken out with the borders of Israel. And from chapter 10 onwards, <laughs> the Gentiles start to come in to the church of the Lord Jesus. In chapter 16, Paul finds himself in a prison in Philippi for preaching the gospel. And though persecuted, he and Silas sing praises unto the Lord and pray. And at midnight, God brings an earthquake to the prison house. The jailer is going to kill himself. They stop him. He springs in, asks for a light, and then comes with that immortal question in verse 30. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now you know the answer. Verse 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. That's very interesting, is it not? Thou shalt be saved and thy house. Why does he say and thy house? Now those who disagree with us will come and they'll say he simply means... That if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. And if anyone in your house believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, they will be saved. But again, you have this problem. Just like on the day of Pentecost, that would be a very strange and redundant thing to bring up to a man, an individual, who is in such personal crisis in this jail in Philippi. 
Would you do that? Have you ever heard it done? Indeed, when you hear this text quoted and when you use it today, I would hazard to guess that you leave that last clause out. An individual comes to you, sir, what must I do to be saved? You would say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. But Paul doesn't. Paul doesn't just use the first part of that statement. He uses the whole. He says, and thy house. Some people might see the problem. Ah, they say, well, this was apostolic revelation. This was something that was given specifically to Paul, a knowledge that he knew concerning this one family. Well, that's odd too, but if it were the case, then that statement really has no particular application to anyone else apart from that jailer in Philippi. All it could do would be muster some kind of vague hope that maybe the Lord will grant us household salvation. Certainly not a promise to you and me today. But I want to challenge that. Is it really just an individual thing about individuals in a household? Is it just something that was for this man and for no other? Or does it sound like anything else? Does it sound like anything else from what you've learned? Does it perhaps sound just like the way God has dealt with his people for years? Well, you have to say it does. Does it sound like a promise to you and to your seed, to you and to your household? And again, you would have to say, yeah, it, it sounds a lot like that. And does it sound like the way Gentile converts came into the Old Testament church with their households in the Old Testament. And again, you'd have to say, well, it sounds very like that too. And does it sound like the promise that was repeated on the day of Pentecost when Peter said that when the gospel was about to break forth unto the Gentiles, the promise is to you and to your children and to all those who are afar off in places like Philippi? Does it sound anything like that? Again, you have to say yes. So scripture is pressing you to see it in this way, that the promise to you and to your children is again repeated in the New Testament. And that Jews and now Gentiles are addressed in the same terms with their households and their children being brought under the promise of God's covenant. But there's a third thing here. Still dealing with the promise. We've had the day of Pentecost. We've got the promise to the Philippian jailer. Thirdly, we have the status of holy children. Turn, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And look at verse 13 and 14. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7 and verse 13 and 14. Where well, the Apostle Paul is dealing with an issue that arose when the gospel went forth among the nations. A husband or, or a wife may have been converted to the Lord Jesus Christ, but their spouse was not. Well, what, what should they do? Should they perhaps now, because they've become a Christian, leave their pagan and unconverted husband or wife? Or, or should they remain with them? And Paul speaks to that in verse 13. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. So if you're converted and your pagan husband is happy to stay with you in the marriage, you stay with him. If he wants rid of you because you're now a Christian, let him go. You're no longer bound. But you do not instigate that. You stay. So conversion to Christ does not divorce or disannul this marriage. Very well, Paul's just told them to stay. Another question arises on the back of that. What does that mean for my children? If I'm a believer and my husband is not, what does that mean for my children? Now, I want to say this first to you, first of all, to you from that. 
that the very significance of this question actually tells you that children are included in the covenant promise. Why? Because if they weren't, why would a believer be asking the question? Why? Why would they even be concerned about the status of their children if their children didn't have any particular covenantal status in the New Testament? It doesn't make any sense. If our, as our Baptist brothers say, that they're just basically brought up in the home and you teach them the word and you take them to church, but there's nothing more significant covenantally concerning them about that, this question would be totally irrelevant. But it seems there was an understanding in the church of Corinth that children did have a distinct status. And the concern here is, how does that apply to a mixed marriage? Is it still applicable to a mixed marriage when there's one believer and one unbeliever? So the significance of the question actually tells you by inference that the children of believers are under the promise. But then we have the significance of the answer. Verse 14, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. <laughs> Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. <coughs> now get what Paul's saying here. Your unbelieving husband is set apart unto a holy use, so that you as a believer can still raise a godly seed unto the Lord. Likewise, the unbelieving wife. To this end that your children are not unclean, that's a loaded term. It means set apart, removed from the covenant people of God. That they're not unclean, <coughs> but that they're holy. And I don't understand, he's not saying that the children of believers are born morally pure, automatically Christians, that they're, they're not sinful the way others are. That's not what he means. But he's using terms that describe outward separation from the world and positive separation unto God. Brethren, in Old Testament terms, it's precisely the contrast between the Jew who was in the covenant and the Gentile who was outside the covenant. It's a way of stating the status as being included in God's holy people. So people in Corinth are concerned about their children in a mixed marriage. What does it mean? And Paul enforces the fact that the children even of one believing parent are covenantally set apart under the promise. Or to put it another way, that the promise that I will be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee in the Old Testament is so inviolable that God in the new covenant sanctifies an unbelieving spouse so that he can uphold the promise and guarantee the status of the children. It's the complete opposite of this idea that somehow the new covenant is distinct in putting the children out of the covenant. It's going further in revealing to us that even the child of one believing parent is still under this covenant promise in the New Testament. So then, to recap, children were included in the promise in the Old Testament. That doesn't change in the New Testament. The promise is repeated at Pentecost. As the gospel goes to the Gentiles, it's repeated again. The status of children remains the same in the covenant and under this promise. So it is not Scripture, brethren but rather a wrong interpretation of Scripture or ideas imposed upon Scripture that sees the children of believers put out in the New Testament. We rather affirm that children are still included in the promise of the covenant in the New Testament period. And that brings us to our 
second main point this morning. That children are members of the church in the New <coughs> Testament. Children are members of the church in the New Testament. This is something else that we established from the Old Testament last time. So does this change? What we've just considered will tell you by way of implication that it's not going to change, but, but we need to flesh it out. And I want to look at a number of important texts here too, beginning with our Lord Jesus in the Gospels, where Jesus teaches us that there are children in the kingdom in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record an occasion when mothers brought their children to Jesus. The disciples prevented them from coming. Jesus rebuked the disciples, and his stated reason was this, Suffer the little children, and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 19, verse 14. Mark chapter 10, verse 14. Luke chapter 18, verse 16. In Mark's account, the children are clearly young enough to be brought in the arms of their mother and then to be taken up in the arms of our Lord Jesus Christ. Luke is more specific and he uses a Greek word which means infant or baby. So these are newborn or babies or infants that are being brought to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Now true, the Lord Jesus will make an application from what he does to the necessity of a childlike spirit on our part to believe him at his word and enter into the kingdom of heaven by faith. However, the statement that Jesus makes in and of itself confronts us with this truth, that there are such <coughs> children and such infants in the kingdom. That is, that there are this class and type of person in the kingdom. Therefore, Jesus says, bring them to me. They're not excluded. Bring them to me, for of such is the kingdom of God. Well, he takes them up in his arms and he blesses them. And together, his word and action tells us that Jesus can and does save babies. Jesus can and does save babies. Therefore, bring them to me. Bring them to me because I can bless them. Bring them to me because I don't need to wait until they reach some magical age of understanding so that they can exercise their will and then I can change their hearts and save them. No, I can do it any time I so please because I am God. It's like the disciples were the original Arminians on this point. They've got to wait till they grow up so God can act to deliver them. Jesus says, no, bring them to me. I'll bless them because of this category are in the kingdom of heaven. But for our purposes today, Christ is saying the kingdom belongs to infants and they are members of it. That he is not waiting for them to grow up to profess their faith for themselves before he includes them in it. This class, babies, a few of them I can see today, children in their mother's arms are in the kingdom. And guess what? They always were. Now, if this is the case, think about it. That Jesus includes them in his church and kingdom and blesses them. Then surely the membership of the visible church must reflect that. We have to include who Jesus includes. We cannot cut out of the membership of the church and kingdom of God this class that God tells us are in it. Brethren, this is in effect what our Baptist brothers do. They may admit reasonably young children into church membership upon the profession of their faith. That varies in Baptist practice. But we can say this with certainty. There are no babes in arms 
who are members of the church. There are no infants who are members of their church. The Bible says they were in it in the Old Testament. Jesus says that they're still in it in the New Testament. Therefore, we have to include them. But then secondly here, the children of believers are saints in the New Testament. The children of believers are saints in the New Testament. We've actually looked at this already when we were considering 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 14. Just to remind you, Paul says, else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. What we were, we were saying then was that the children are still under the covenant promise. But that also tells you that they're in the church. Why? Because the word holy is the same word that is translated saint in the New Testament. So that a saint is really a holy one or one that has been set apart from the world unto God. So in chapter 7, verse 14, he says, now your children are holy, now your children are saints. Well, let's turn back to chapter 1 and look at verse 2. When he writes to the church that is in Corinth, how does he address them? Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified or set apart in Christ Jesus, called to be saints or holy ones, with all them that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Now, before you start running to this text and you say, well, you know, it's the church of God. They're sanctified in Christ. They're called to be saints. They must be regenerated. They must be real believers in Christ. Paul doesn't have that problem. Paul hasn't forgot how he addressed the church in Corinth. And when Paul comes to chapter 7 and says, now, let's deal with this question you're concerned about, about the status of your children, he says, they're saints. They're not unclean. They're not uncircumcised. They're not outside the covenant. They're in it. And so when he writes to the church in Corinth, he writes to the visible congregation of the Lord that is built up and, and, and composed of believers and their children. It's just the way the Lord would address his covenant people in the Old Testament period with respect to this status. You could look at Ephesians chapter 1 to the saints that are in Ephesus. Colossians chapter 1 to the saints and faithful brethren that are in Colossae. And then go to Ephesians chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. They're a class and category among the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, just like Jesus said. Obey your parents in the Lord. You say, well, all children have to obey their parents, and they do. But all children are not numbered among the saints that are in Ephesus and motivated to that task on the basis of their status in the church. The children of the congregation are admonished, just like the wives, the husbands, the servants, and the masters. They're admonished and expected to live godly in Christ as a member of of the church of God in Ephesus. Well, let me make some application in closing. You know already that this series is designed to help you understand what the Bible teaches and that therefore there is a lot of instruction. And a lot of our application of what we learn is going to be to establish the truth over against what we perceive to be error. So it's not going to be tremendously experiential in that sense. But we need to know these things in order that we get to the right and proper Christian experience in our congregation. So the first thing I would say to you today by way of application is that children are included in the promise of the covenant in the New Testament as they were in the Old. And those who deny this do it without the warrant of the word of God. They not only miss a rich vein of theology, 
this covenantal continuity from the Old Testament into the New Testament. But listen, brethren, they remove great encouragement from Christian parents. And they rob, by their false view of things, the covenant privileges of the children of believers. Now tread carefully here. We are well aware that our Baptist brethren are sincere Christians wrestling with Scripture in earnest, and they mean no malice whatsoever. They want to come to a proper understanding of the Word. But our, in, our conclusion, <coughs> our conclusion <coughs> demands that we see this as a serious thing. To take God's covenant promise away from God's covenant people. We can love our brethren, but we will take no delight in that whatsoever. It's done without a warrant from the word of God, and it has consequences. Secondly, children are included in the church in the New Testament as they are in the Old Testament. All the children of believers. We cannot reconcile the word of God with a policy of only adult professing members of the church or only young teen and upward professing members of the church or even eight-year-olds and upward as members of the church of Christ. Now, I have aggravated my Baptist brethren in the past, and I repent of it by saying that their view of the church is a childless church. I want to mo modify it somewhat. We need to be more specific. Because yes, many young children are included upon profession of faith. And they wrestle with this question, at what age will we accept a profession of their faith? Is it too young? Or we, do we want it to be 12? Or, or do we want to leave it until they're 16? What happens? This is a real question. What happens if they fall away from their profession? What happens if later they realize that they weren't converted at that time? What do we do with them then? And the real issue is one of rebaptizing. And so they don't want to baptize them too young in case they have to baptize them again when they're older. It's a real struggle that they're wrestling through in their theology. So I'm going to modify what I say. We accept the fact that young children may be admitted to membership upon profession of faith in Baptist churches. Nevertheless, many young children and all infants are in principle excluded until they make a profession of faith. Baptist churches are, in principle, therefore, at least infantless churches. Very young children <laughs> less churches. And until then, they simply attend church and they sit with the members of the church. They're in the building, but they're not of the church. God never put children out of the membership of the church, and nor should we. Therefore, the children of this congregation are members. They are numbered among the visible saints in the congregation that are in Mebane. And you children need to understand that, and you adults need to understand it as well. That is not the same as saying that we believe our children are all born again and true-hearted Christians. Every one of us needs to seek the Lord. But we're going to preach the gospel to our children. We're going to call them to repent and believe the gospel. And we're going to call them to live faithfully in the covenant as visible saints and disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because our children are included in the promise. And our children <laughs> are members of the church. And what we're going to see, God willing, in the weeks ahead is this.
that as, as our doctrine of the covenant and the church, so will be our doctrine of the subjects of baptism. It will all come together and we will see that the children of believers have a right to and indeed must receive the sign of baptism in the new covenant. May God bless his word to our hearts. Please stand as we pray.